From the earliest civilizations, humans have needed shelter, and as the population grew, we needed bigger and better structures to take shelter in. We needed homes and buildings and monuments to show the might of our societies, structures to cross over natural land barriers, as well as protecting the people from the elements in their environment and the enemies that hope to exert their force and gain more power. As humanity went from the earlier wood, thatch, and leaves-based homes to early bricks, we began to gain a better our understanding about the materials that would best suit our needs, eventually developing substances that met all our needs and more, allowing us to rapidly construct amazing buildings and structures once thought impossible. Today we're talking about concrete and the incredible ways it changed the direction of entire civilizations, becoming one of the most used substances in the world, second only to water. But we're also going to be looking into the dark side of the material and the reasons why we may eventually run out. This is Learn Something New. Concrete was invented twice, once by the Romans and then again centuries later. We're solely going to be diving into the modern form of concrete, but the Roman concrete is a fascinating topic that could probably serve as its own episode. Let me know in the comments if you're interested in that. After the Roman concrete was lost to history, hundreds of years of experimentation was required in order to get it back. But in the second half of the 1700s, English engineers were experimenting with heating up limestone to create a powder that, when wet, would set and hold together. An early modern use of concrete was in the 1750s when British civil engineer John Smeaton was commissioned to construct a lighthouse off the coast of Cornwall. Smeaton used limestone containing clay that he fired before grinding it into a powder, using the substance to rebuild the Eddystone Lighthouse. And this newfound method wouldn't become the new norm, but instead inspire many to begin looking for ways to perfect his mixture. Finally, in 1824, that perfection nearly became reality when an Englishman named Joseph Adspin invented Portland cement by burning finely ground chalk and clay in a kiln until the carbon dioxide was removed. He named it Portland cement because of how the end result resembled the high quality building stones often sought out in Portland, England, after being mixed with water, sand, and gravel to form concrete. Abstin would continue to improve on the formula for his cement mixture, and with these improvements, its popularity would only grow. Other than a few exceptions in England and France, most of the world in the 19th century solely used concrete for industrial buildings, as it was considered socially unacceptable for home construction, almost entirely for aesthetic reasons. This obviously wouldn't last forever though, as in 1875, the first documented concrete home was built in the United States in Port Chester, New York still standing to this day. The mechanical engineer who built it claimed that it was for his wife because of her extreme fear of fires, and he worked hard to make it socially acceptable, designing the concrete to resemble masonry. It was also during this time that the next huge leap in concrete would emerge, developed practically simultaneously throughout Europe and the United States. This was reinforced concrete. Reinforced concrete was patented in 1877 by Ernest L. Ransom with a system that used twisted square rods to improve the bond between steel and concrete, paving the way for larger, stronger structures like the first concrete high-rise building constructed in 1903 in Cincinnati, Ohio, standing 210 feet tall. This, along with the American Society for Test and Materials establishing a standardized formula for Portland cement, meant that it was becoming more widespread. In fact, it was in 1897 that Sears started selling 50-gallon drums of imported Portland cement for $3.40 each, and its use was beginning to go beyond shelter and industrial buildings. Some streets were beginning to be paved with concrete, and notably, in World War I, when the United States noticed steel was becoming increasingly scarce in a war that seemingly had no clear end in sight, they began to try and find ways to save on steel. With President Woodrow Wilson approving the construction of 24 concrete ships to be used in the naval forces. With a budget of $50 million, construction on the ships began in late 1917, but only 12 were completed by the end of the war. And though by the time they were completed, there wasn't much use of these ships in World War I, 24 new concrete ships would be made in World War II after steel once again became scarce. But as impressive as these were, there were far greater projects the US had put into motion, chiefly the Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam had been a long time coming, 
with the Colorado River being seen as a potential source of irrigation water as early as the 1890s. But the plans for the dam wouldn't be set into motion until Congress authorized the project in 1928, with construction beginning in 1931. The giant project would bring thousands of workers to the area. But when considering pouring concrete for the dam, there was a major hurdle. Since concrete heats and contracts as it cures, the potential for uneven cooling and concrete cracking was a serious concern. The Bureau of Reclamation Engineers calculated that if the dam were to be built in a single continuous pour, the concrete would take 125 years to cool, and the resulting stresses would cause the dam to crack and crumble all the while. Instead, they needed to pour the concrete into individual blocks in large columns each containing steel pipes throughout where the cool river water and then later refrigerated water could be poured through to help the block cure evenly without cracking. The exceptional size of the dam required an exceptionally large amount of concrete, around two and a half million cubic meters, all poured over two years, with an additional 850,000 cubic meters being used in the power plant and other surrounding works. That's enough concrete to pave a two-lane highway from San Francisco to New York. Yet, within mere months of the Hoover Dam's completion, an even larger project was beginning to pour its first concrete. The Grand Coulee Dam was built in the state of Washington and contained an astounding 9 million cubic meters of concrete making it one of the largest concrete structures in the world. From here, concrete would only grow in popularity, with more homes, more industrial buildings, and more roads, all using concrete as a cheap way to make incredibly strong and long-lasting structures. Today, around 30% of the United States' interstate is paved in concrete, lasting on average two to four times longer than asphalt, and holding up better than asphalt under heavy weight. But as more countries became developed and more concrete megaprojects were introduced, the once plentiful concrete ingredients have started to become strained. Not necessarily the limestone used to make the cement, or the water that gets mixed with the cement to make concrete, but rather the aggregates, the stuff the cement mix is combined with, namely sand. And this is a huge problem. The type of sand that works best when creating concrete is rough, contrasted with the vast amounts of smooth sand that are contained within the world's deserts. The proper sand that's used comes about from water erosion on riverbeds or beaches. The roughness of the sand helps give more surface area for the cement mix to bind to. But with the right kind of sand being one of the most extracted resources on the planet, many places are starting to run out. Since 2005, an incredible 25 Indonesian islands have disappeared completely because of massive erosion caused by illegal sand mining. These sand pirates often work with organized crime to sell the illicit sand to the developers in growing cities who need it to complete their projects. And nowhere is this more prevalent than in China, which far outpaces the world in concrete usage, and subsequently, sand usage. In three years, it poured more concrete than the US did throughout the entirety of the 1900s, and currently accounts for half the world's sand usage yearly. While there are alternatives to the sand found on beaches, like using crushed rock, recycled construction materials, or ore sand left over from mines, as of right now, nothing works as well for the low cost of natural sand. One of the most amazing things about concrete is that there was no major decision or event that led to the mass adoption of concrete. Instead, it was a gradual gravitation toward the material as it became better and more suitable for nearly every building situation. And while today it's widely ranked as one of the ugliest building materials to use, it's undeniable that the immense scale of projects and expansion the world has seen couldn't have been accomplished without its invention or mass adoption. Yet, with anything, it's important to realize that it's finite, and its overuse could cost us dearly. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking it down below. Thanks again, and I will see you in the next one.